The Sailor Who Fell From Grace With The Sea by Yukio Mishima tells the story of a man named Ryuji, who gives up his life as a sailor in search of adventure in order to settle down, marry a single mother, and live happily ever after. Only this book doesn't exactly have a fairy tale ending. Thematically, this book is about the loss of what we might call glory, or the loss of hope for meaningful existence in modern life, or the loss of manhood, what the Greeks conceptually called Andrea, or the Romans Virtus, and to a degree what the Norse called Dränger. Though these words only marginally hint at the feeling of reckless adventure that the sailor Ryuji has felt calling him all his life in the swelling of the sea. When we first meet Ryuji in the novel, he is in his mid-thirties. He's never settled down because he's always chasing an ethereal call to greatness, a feeling that is difficult to describe. He hadn't been able to explain his idea of glory and death, or the longing and the melancholy pent up in his chest, or the other dark passions choking in the ocean's swell. Whenever he tried to talk about those things, he failed. If there were times when he felt he was worthless, there were others, when something like the magnificence of the sunset over Manila Bay sent its radiant fire through him, and he knew that he had been chosen to tower above other men. I've never done much, he thinks to himself, but I've lived my whole life thinking of myself as the only real man. And if I'm right, then a limpid, lonely horn is going to trumpet through the dawn someday, and a turgid cloud laced with light will sweep down, and the poignant voice of glory will call for me from the distance, and I'll have to jump out of bed and set out alone. That's why I've never married. I've waited and waited, and here I am, past thirty. It seems Ryuji has become disenchanted with the sea. He's drawn to the romantic vision of life as a seaman, and everything it represents, the life of danger and wrestling with a terrible force beyond his comprehension, but he is disillusioned with the reality of being a sailor. Real life isn't all that it's cracked up to be. The ocean seemed to offer greatness, but a sense of glory was always something beyond him. Never a reality. Always promised, but never delivered. And now he's wondering if it was all a lie. And it hasn't helped that he's gone and fallen in love with a woman. When his ship puts into port, he ends up giving a tour of the vessel to a single mother named Fusako and her nautically obsessed son, Niboru. Ryuji and Fusako fall in love, and for perhaps the first time in his life, Ryuji is presented with a peaceful, stable, rooted life on land with a family. He decides it is best to settle down, concluding that there really is no glory to be had in life at sea after all. He would be 34 in May, it was time to abandon the dream he had cherished too long. Time to realize that no specially tailored glory was waiting for him. Time to open his eyes. Already we can see that this is a relevant book, especially for men. Because we are living in a time when men are longing for the sea, so to speak. For freedom and purpose and greatness and the voice of glory in a world dominated by Starbucks, McDonald's, pumpkin spice lattes, and the Kardashians. Like Ryuji, men are putting off getting married until they are in their 30s, waiting for a glory that still hasn't come, and it seems may never come. We are faced with the choice between holding out, waiting for the opportunity to do something great and meaningful, or settling down and starting a family. We are faced with the same question that Ryuji poses to himself. Are you going to give up the life which has detached you from the world, kept you remote, impelled you toward the pinnacle of manliness? Are you going to give up that luminous freedom? Ryuji decides that he will give it up. And his choice doesn't just affect him. It also affects Noboru, his prospective new stepson. You see, like Ryuji, the young Noboru is also fascinated with the sea because it is the essence of glory. The sea itself is not just a symbol for heroism, it is a real-life matrix, a real-life theater for masculine virtues like risk and self-reliance and courage to be acted out. There is real danger to be met, real forces to be conquered. When the sailor Ryuji comes riding off of the waves into Noboru's life, Ryuji becomes a symbol of the sea itself and everything it stands for, an avatar, a simulacrum, a mediator. Noboru, who is only 13, has no actuality as a person, no experience in life. His existence 
still consists in dreaming and imaging the world, so he latches on to Ryuji and lives vicariously through the sailor. This relationship hints not only at the importance of men as role models, but also more importantly, identifies men as symbols, icons, and archetypes into which boys grow, which is something we never really talk about. There is a vital connection between boys, men, and the symbolism of manhood. For a boy who has not known the world by personal experience, a man like Ryuji is the window, or one might say, a peephole, through which a boy like Noboru sees the world. The man represents the hope of the world to the boy. If this is ever destroyed, it will mean the end of the world, Noboru murmured, barely conscious. I guess I'd do anything to stop that, no matter how awful. And believe me, Noboru isn't kidding when he says he'll do awful things to save his icon of the sea. This is where things start to go off the rails for Western readers. When Ryuji does decide to give up his life at sea, Noboru is crushed. It means the end of his world. His symbol of the world is shattered, and there is only one cure, according to the chief of Noboru's gang, and that is death. They will have to kill Ryuji. Only in death can meaning be restored. The connection between death and meaning is delineated at length in chapter 5 of part 1, when Noboru and his gang kill and dissect a stray kitten. Noboru had withstood the ordeal from beginning to end. Now his half-dazed brain envisioned the warmth of the scattered viscera and the pools of blood in the gutted belly finding a wholeness and perfection in the rapture of the dead kitten's large, languid soul. The liver, limp beside the corpse, became a soft peninsula. The squashed heart, a little sun. The reeled out bowels, a white atoll. And the blood in the belly, the tepid waters of a tropical sea. Death had transfigured the kitten into a perfect, autonomous world. The dead kitten merges with the sea itself, symbolically. Death becomes the, quote, cure for the loss of the sea. In the death of the cat, the boys become one with the cat, feeling their own beings, their own fleshy, physical, real existence in the act of its dissection. The chief always insisted it would take acts such as this to fill the world's great hollows. Though nothing else could do it, he said, murder would fill those gaping caves in much the same way that a crack along its face will fill a mirror. Then they would achieve real power over existence. Holy crap, right? This seems pretty insane to us, pretty psychopathic. Are these boys villains, or are they a twisted band of heroes that we cannot understand? Mishima is a good enough novelist not to tell us outright which opinion to have of them, but my suspicion is that Mishima might say that the boys were wrong to kill an innocent man, yet they inadvertently administer the cure in a way that is tinctured with both good and bad. The cure is necessary, but it's administered in a way that is evil, an evil out of which more good may come. But I could be wrong. I'm no expert on Mishima's philosophy, but a cursory knowledge of Mishima's life seems to suggest, at least to me, that he himself identified more with the sailor than with the murderous boys. To my knowledge, he never killed anyone, but he did bring about his own death by committing the ritual suicide of seppuku. In the midst of a modernizing world that left little room for masculinity, Mishima sought his own salvation in death, not in killing. He spoke at length in interviews about finding meaning in death. And the novel concludes by painting a picture of the world that is teleologically made for death. A vision of death 
Now eternally beyond his reach, majestic, acclaimed, heroic death unfurled its rapture across his brain. And if the world had been provided for just this radiant death, then why shouldn't the world also perish for it? There is a vital connection between death and the phenomenological existence of the world. If you reject a heroic death, then you reject the world itself. This is something I, for one, have difficulty resonating with. But even if Mishima seems incomprehensible to us, if he presents ideas we cannot resonate with, he's still worth reading. For me, there is a certain value in being slapped across the face with something I cannot understand, but nevertheless which I must reckon with. This is the pinnacle of art and the essence of religion, and Mishima seems to be walking his own thin line between the two. The mere fact that I cannot share Mishima's philosophy of life and death makes it worth reading. But I would be remiss if I did not conclude that Mishima's book exists in a world that is fundamentally false. My evaluation is that, at best, this book has the falsehood of a single dimension of only portraying one slice of life to the exclusion of the rest, while at worst, it is an undue glorification of death. In my naivete, as I was reading through this book, I was hoping Mishima would go in the direction of Kierkegaard in his books Either Or and Stages on Life's Way, offering one perspective that says an aesthetic drive for sensory majesty is grand, as Naboru holds, and another perspective that says such a longing for aesthetic feeling leads only to despair, as Ryuji seems to be discovering. The antidote is to gain a self by getting married. Marriage is necessary to selfhood because selfhood needs a history, a continuity that is impossible in singleness, which only yields dislocated moments of truth in which nothing happens between the moments that allows or counts for personal growth. Nothing in the series of moments amounts to or can become a subject, a self. Ryuji is disillusioned because he lacks a self. A self he could gain in marriage. Marriage is therefore good, but there are also exceptions to the rule, and sometimes the best thing to do is to live outside the conventions of marital and civic virtue. In other words, I guess I was hoping Mishima would turn out to be a Kierkegaardian Christian, which in hindsight is absolutely absurd. Silly me. Nevertheless, I take the same approach to Mishima as I do to thinkers like Abraham Maslow or Jordan Peterson. I think they completely understand the problems we're facing right now and the inevitable consequences of those problems. However, they are fumbling in the darkness for a solution, grasping at straws. And I think the same is true for Yukio Mishima. He understood that modernism is problematic in many dimensions, but his solution is only half the truth.